So just like we did in um, the chapter about the hip and the chapter about the knee, um, we talked about osteology, um, and then we talked about the kinematics and arthrokinematics and motion and stability. Uh, and now we're going to talk about that with regard to the foot and ankle. So the classic fundamental movements that we've been talking about since day one um, occur within planes perpendicular to the three classes, uh, classic axes of rotation, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior, and vertical. But um, a lot of the joints in the foot produce an oblique movement. And so we're going to introduce these new terms of um, pronation or supination, which are actually combinations of fundamental movements to produce the functional movements of the foot. So just talking about, we're going to go through all the fundamental movements. So dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Um, they occur in the sagittal plane about a medial lateral axis of rotation. So um, when, remember when I was talking about the malleoli in the last section, um, we have that medial lateral axis. If you drew a line straight through um, your medial and lateral malleoli, um, that's our medial lateral axis of rotation. Uh, and dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occur in the sagittal plane about that medial lateral axis of rotation. So dorsiflexion brings the dorsal part of the foot towards the anterior aspect of the tibia. In other words, bringing your toes for, towards you. Plantar flexion moves the dorsal part away from the anterior aspect of the tibia, so bringing your toes away from you. Um, also sometimes called pointing your toes. Inversion and eversion occur in the frontal plane about an anterior posterior axis of rotation. So um, inversion turns a point anywhere on the plantar aspect of the foot toward the midline, and eversion turns a point on the plantar aspect of the foot away from the midline. So you can look at inversion and eversion and think, eee, they're a little bit of uh, rotationally oriented movements maybe, but um, we are mostly just doing them in the frontal plane. Um, the Chalo curl joint or the ankle joint, it doesn't move in this plane. So inversion and eversion come from the other joints of the foot. Um, so they, they come from combinations of movements of the tarsals and metatarsals. Ab and adduction occur about horizontal plane on a vertical axis of rotation. Adduction describes the horizontal plane rotation of the foot that moves toward the midline and abduction describes the horizontal plane rotation of the foot that moves away from the midline. So these also occur in the um, more distal joints of the foot. And it's a combination. It's not any one joint that does this. It is um, several joints combined. So pronation and supination are combinations of those fundamental movements that we just talked about. So um, pronation is a combined movement of eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion of any region of the ankle and foot. So it's a combination at the subtalar joint and the transverse tarsal joint mostly um, that combines those, <clears throat> excuse me, combines those three fundamental movements of abduction, eversion, and dorsiflexion. Supination is a combined movement of inversion, adduction, and plantar flexion of any region of the ankle or foot. So um, pronation and supination happen naturally during the gait cycle. Um, as, as we land on um, the heel, we um, perform eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion, rotate a little bit in in towards the big toe, so the weight is directed towards the first metatarsal. Um, and then we push off of that first metatarsal. So um, you'll hear, you, a lot of people have heard um, uh, when they're buying their running shoes or um, something about over pronating, and that is um, where the, the pronation happens too fast and collapses the arch, and we'll talk about that more in the um, functional aspect of it. And you'll talk about it way more in your um, 
lower extremity orthopedics class. So we're just defining motions right now and talking about it. Um, supination, you, when you land on the heel, you start in a relatively supinated position, so inverted, adducted, and plantar flexed, and then you move into a relatively pronated position, um, everted, abducted, and dorsiflexed. So I want you to know which movements uh, are combined to make up pronation and supination, and then we'll talk about what joints, um, what happens at the joints when the movements occur. So the talocrural joint, it's the most proximal joint in the ankle foot complex. Um, it's also called the ankle joint, created by the articulation between the trochlea or dome of the talus and the concavity form between the distal tibia and fibula. The major weight bearing part of the joint is between the tibia and the talus. The um, fibula actually just helps uh, make it more concave. Um, that concave part of the joint is often referred to as a mortise because it, it's resemblant to a mortise and tenon joint used by carpenters. So in this diagram, it's from the book, it has the carpenter's version of the mortise and tenon joint, and it's just a more stable joint than if they just nailed two things together. They have that um, mortise and tenon, and it makes it more stable. So the tibia and fibula um, articulated together at the distal tibiofibular joint um, gives us a more stable ankle joint. So the tail of curl joint has one degree of freedom. It, does, it permits ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion in the sagittal plane. Those motions are important to walking and squatting. Um, so we have, to, we have to be able to um, dorsiflex <laughs> to get down and pick something up off the ground. So uh, muscles that, we're going to talk about this to the point where you'll, you'll know it like the back of your hand. <laughs> the muscles that go anterior to the medial lateral axis of rotation perform dorsiflexion, and muscles that go posterior perform plantar flexion. So the malleoli, they're your, your points of reference for um, your uh, medial lateral axis. And so um, your, anything anterior to the malleoli um, does dorsiflexion. Anything posterior to the malleoli does plantar flexion. So this is a nice uh, radiograph because it shows the spaces in the joints. You can really see that subtalar joint well and the talocrural joint. But also I like this um, radiograph because the you can really see how that um, talocrural articulation does um, that one degree of freedom. You can see how the um, convex talus is moving on the concave um, tibia. So with the foot free and open chain, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occur as the convex trochlea rolls and slides in opposite directions within the concave mortise of the tibia and fibula. With the foot fixed in closed chain, the concavity formed by the mortise rolls and slides in the same direction over the convex dome of the talus. So if we're working on someone, we're doing a joint mobilization in open chain, we want roll and slide in opposite directions. And um, so I hope you got to um, play with some ankle models um, and some bones in lab and this arthrokinematic relationship is making more sense to you now. And if it's not, hey, let's talk about that. Um, we have tons of ligamentous support in the talocrural joint. And ankle sprains, which probably of many people have either experienced or you know someone who has, they are damaged to these um, supporting ligaments. So um, first of all, though, before we even get to those ligaments, the intraosseous membrane between the tibia and fibula binds the tibia and fibula together, and it provides stability to that um, distal, distal tibiofibular and the talocrural joint. So um, that's our first level of stability, is that intraosseous membrane. Um, we have anterior and posterior posterior <laughs> tibiofibular ligaments. You know what I love about ligaments? I'll just say right out. Um, most of them, except the deltoid ligament, sorry buddy, most of them tell you where they live and where they go to and from. So tibiofibular 
ligaments, they go from the tibia to the fibula. They bind them together. That totally makes sense, right? So it prevents motion between the tibia and fibula. Um, and it improves stability of that mortise joint. Um, the deltoid ligament limits eversion. So it's on slack when you're in neutral or inverted. It's on stretch when you're everted. That gives you a clue that it's on the medial side of the foot. Um, the lateral collateral ligament limits inversion. It's on the lateral side of the foot. And its name tells you that, which is just lovely. Um, so the ones that tell us something by their names, um, they're my favorites, and the other ones are going to have to work to, to uh, uh, win my favor, I guess. <laughs> but the deltoid ligament does work. It works really hard to stabilize your ankle. So, okay, it's back in my good graces. So the talocurl joint, um, it has um, more and less stable positions. It's most stable during maximal dorsiflexion when most of the collateral ligaments and all of the plantar flexor muscles are stretched. Um, it also, the um, trochlea of the talus is wedged between the tibia and fibula and when you go into full dorsiflexion, um, it wedges it even more. And so um, that is the most stable position when you're in maximal dorsiflexion. The least stable position of the tail curl joint is full plantar flexion when most of the collateral ligaments and all the plantar flexor muscles aren't slack and you're not um, using that wedge to your advantage. So imagine how unstable your ankle might be if you're wearing five inch heels. I've never worn five inch heels and I don't even think I could walk on them, but um, that is a very unstable position for your tail curl joint. Um, your lig you're not putting your ligaments in the best position to support you, and um, your muscles aren't helping you all that much either. So um, that's my, I've had a radiograph somewhere of a foot in a, in a high heel versus um, a foot in a low heel. Um, I, th I think it's in one of these slides, but I'll, I'll make sure I show it to you if it's not. <clears throat> so okay, that, that's my diatribe against high heels. Um, so you can imagine how strong um, ballet dancers have to be when they're um, doing point work, when they're dancing on their toes, they've got their ankle in its most unstable position and they're balancing. So um, ballet dancers are super strong and super flexible. So as we go down the chain, the next um, joint in line is the subtalar joint which is the articulation between the facets on the inferior surface of the talus and the matching facets on the superior surface of the calcaneus. Um, it is designed to allow two planes of movement, frontal and horizontal plane motions between the foot and the lower leg. Um, the motions are essential for adapting to uneven ground surfaces or cutting medial or laterally. So playing tennis or playing soccer, or you have to do those <clears throat> excuse me, side to side stability movements. So in this picture, it shows um, subtalar neutral in the first, in picture A, um, eversion and abduction in picture B, and inversion and adduction in picture C. So when a lot of times when you're casting someone for an orthotic, you'll have them in non-weight bearing, lying prone with their feet off the end of a table and um, you are finding their tailor neutral because that's the uh, most stable position for the joint and so we want to set up the orthotic that's going to support them in that position. So the subtalar joint, um, it has that those combined motions of inversion adduction and eversion abduction. Um, the side to side motions are inversion and eversion um, so in the frontal plane and the rotary or horizontal plane motions are adduction, abduction. So during all the subtalar motions, the, um, the trochlea is usually well stabilized within the mortise shape of the talocurl joint. So um, that stability proximally gives us more mobility distally. Isn't that neat? Just like every other area in the body. So um, the motions at the subtalar joint 
allow for independent movement between the calcaneus and the talus, um, going through the frontal and horizontal planes. So while walking, um, the calcaneus is either free or it's held fixed under the body's weight. So when you're in the swing phase of gait, the calcaneus is free. And when you're in the stance phase, it's held fixed under your body weight. So <clears throat> while you're in the stance phase of walking, the leg and the talus move as one piece over the fixed calcaneus. Um, so you don't really have um, open chain motion of the calcaneus over a fixed talus, um, except passively. So it's not something that happens actively. So the, going down the chain, the next um, set of joints is the transverse tarsal joint. So the transverse tarsal joint is not a single articulation of one bone with another, like the subtalar joint. Um, it consists of the talonavicular joint and the calcaneocuboid jo joint. So it's where it's um, basically on the distal end of the rear foot going into the midfoot if you want to think of it that way. Um, it allows the midfoot to move independently of the rear foot. So the, the transverse tarsal joint permits the most pure form of pronation and supination. Um, pronation has nearly equal elements of eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion at the transverse tarsal joints, and supination has nearly equal elements of inversion, adduction, and plantar flexion. So um, even though other joints are involved in um, full pronation and supination, you get the most equal um, distribution of the three different movements at the transverse tarsal joint. And those are planar joints between the tarsals. So the medial longitudinal arch of the foot, it is the load bearing and shock absorbing structure of our foot. So um, we have active muscle forces that contribute to supporting the medial um, longitudinal arch, but they're generally not required to support the arch while standing. Unless somebody has um, pes planus, which is flat foot, um, then that's when we have to train the muscles to support because the passive structures aren't doing it for us. And we'll talk about what structures support the arch. Um, the arch normally lowers as the rear foot everts sl slightly to maintain forces at tolerable levels, so you're not getting a lot of twisting in your foot. So there is a lot of movement in our arch, so it has to, we have to have mobility and stability. But its main job is stability and shock absorption. So <clears throat> we have passive and active supporting structures for the medial longitudinal arch. Um, the structures that are passively support the arch are the plantar fascia. So in the top picture there, letter D is the plantar fascia. It's, it's um, tight connective tissue. You can see how it's strung between the calcaneus and the um, first metatarsal, or all the metatarsals really. Um, and um, it provides passive support to um, keep the arch in that um, sprung position, basically. The spring ligament, which is um, letter A on that picture, lots of the plantar ligaments, we have a big aponeurosis on the bottom of um, our foot. Um, the integrity of the talonavicular joint um, passively supports the arch because a lot of the arch is the bony structure. Um, the deltoid ligament on the medial side and just the shapes of the tarsal bones are set up to be in that arched position. So um, I hope you looked at this in lab, but if you didn't, next time you're in lab, grab a foot model and look at how the bones articulate together and how they support that arch. So those are our passive supporting structures for the foot. So if any of those um, break down, we also have active supporting structures, which we'll talk about next. So if you have a plantar fascia tear, you're going to have less arch support. If you have um, spring ligament or deltoid ligament um, strains or, or sprains or tears, um, there's going to be less support for the arch. Um, any problem with the plantar ligaments, you're going to have less support for the arch. And if you have any fractures or problems with your bones, the, the, the shapes of the bones are affected, you're going to, um, art, you're going to have trouble supporting that arch. So um, a lot of times we're providing orthotics um, or other uh, strategies for arch support 
um, to make up for the fact that some of these passive structures aren't doing it for us. The primary active supporting structures are the tibialis posterior, um, the peroneus longus, the intrinsic muscles of the um, plantar aspect of the foot. So we have that passive support from the, um, the passive elements, basically, ligaments and bony structure. And then we have active support from the muscles, which can actually help to um, support that foot. So the tibialis anterior and the um, peroneus longus um, form what's called the stirrup of the foot um, because of where they attach. So you can think of how a stirrup acts and it helps hold up that arch. The tibialis posterior um, actually has a, it has a line of pull for plantar flexion and it can um, help support that arch um, through the uh, muscle action. So the distal joints of the foot, which make up the forefoot, include the tarsometatarsal, which is between the cuneiforms and the cuboid and the metatarsals, um, the metatarsophalangeal, which is basically your toe knuckles, if you want to think of them that way, between the metatarsals and the um, proximal phalanges. And um, all three of those sets of joints play an important role in walking. Um, the interphalangeal joints between the different phalanges it gives you that toe flexibility that you need in walking. Anytime you think you don't need that, tape your toe up and see how well you walk. Um, I work with one PT who's a foot and ankle specialist, and so we get a lot of people after toe, foot, or ankle surgery, and um, I love working with feet. It's really fun. Um, there are lots of, so there are all these different joints, um, they all have to have mobility in order for you to have good walking. And so working on joint mobility for all the individual toes, you don't think of it as being that important, but it really is. The articulations of the metatarsal bases with the um, tarsals, the um, distal tarsals, cuneiforms and cuboid, um, form those tarsal metatarsal joints, and they serve as a base for the rays of the foot. So each um, metatarsal and phalange combination, so the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, are considered the ray. So the first ray is the first metatarsal and the two phalanges of the um, first digit. The second ray is the second metatarsal and the three phalanges. So um, the tarsal metatarsal joints are relatively rigid, except for the first, because the foot has to, the first has to um, accept that weight and allow for more motion during walking. Um, so the first has more plantar and dorsiflexion. Um, and there's some inversion and eversion in the tarsal metatarsal joints as well. So we need that stability, we need that um, mobility in the joints to um, adapt to different ground surfaces with our feet. The metatarsophalangeal joints, they're formed between the convex head of the metatarsals and the shallow concave base of the proximal phalanges. So they allow similar motions to um, the analogous metacarpophalangeal joints in the hand, so extension, which is dorsiflexion in the foot, flexion, which is plantar flexion in the foot, and ab and adduction. So they have two planes of motion. They're condyloid joints, joints by the way. The distal, um, the interphalangeal joints are the most distal joints in the foot, and each toe has a proximal and distal interphalangeal joint except the big toe, which only has one. Um, so the motion is limited in those joints to primarily deflection and extension. And extension is, is typically limited to just a neutral position of the joint. Um, so there's not a ton of movement in the toe interphalangeal joints. But um, sometimes I've, I've definitely worked a lot on people's um, toes if they had a hammer toe or um, some muscular issues. Um, Graston can be pretty effective for um, working on people's toes. I've had some good results with that. So um, just because the toes don't have, the interphalangeal joints don't have very much motion doesn't mean that we don't sometimes work on them.